Richard Medhurst is uh, one of our favourite guests with ratcheting up some of the biggest audience numbers. That's why we call on him quite as often as we do. And he always kindly accepts our invitation. Richard, uh, you are uh, renowned principally as a journalist concerned with the Middle East and heaven knows uh, there's enough to be busy with there. But you also have a global uh, perspective. And so uh, I kind of teed up before the break. Are you, like me, and like uh, one or two of the correspondents on the show so far, surprised that uh, Zelensky was able to invade Russia? And how do you think that's going to end? Hi, George. Thanks for having me on and uh, appreciate the kind words. I... Um yeah, I mean, it is smart in the sense that, uh, you know, they took the Russians by surprise. The element of surprise is, is always the number one uh, uh, asset that you can have in any war. Uh, nevertheless, the, the problem is not getting into Russia. The problem is holding ground um, and uh, then getting out. You know, I, I think, uh, as a matter of fact, Zelensky kind of proved uh, Putin's point and the Russians' point, because we, we should again highlight this is not a Putin position, this is a Russian position. When you're the largest country in the world, and you've got, um, uh, you, you know, almost almost a dozen time zones, not quite, but almost, uh, and, uh, you know, you're, you're basically vulnerable in, in a sense. It's, it's simply physically, logistically impossible to guard every single uh, mile or centimeter or inch of the border. And so, you know, they, they, they got in, and uh, we're talking about a few thousand troops here. This is, you know, just preliminary information from both both sides. But it, it does it does explain why the Russians were worried about having Ukraine in NATO, because uh, you have then essentially open season. Uh, they can just, you know, carry out uh, incursions and raids and uh, beyond any time they like. And so I think uh, he's not going to achieve anything by this strategically it, it, it's just a kind of uh, stunt to garner support for a, a losing war and i can uh, if you'd like me to i can go into much more detail about what you know the defenses the russians built but you know the, the point is that in my opinion i think they lost the ukrainians lost the war already about a year and a half ago you know this spring counteroffensive they talked about never came so ever since then they've just you know the front line simply hasn't moved uh, certainly not in ukraine's favor and so you know, this is just a, it's just a publicity stunt to try and get some more dollars before, you know, the next U.S. president comes in. It, it must be damaging, though, to the armor propra of the Russians, to their dignity to uh, be invaded in this way, albeit by uh, a, a force only a few thousand strong. It's likely to harden resolve in Moscow, in the Kremlin, in the armed forces, is it not? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, it's not lost on me, the historical connotation of, uh, you know, not just European, but specifically German uh, armored vehicles, you know, barging into Russia and, uh, you know, particularly in Kursk. I mean, we're talking about the largest tank battle in World War II history. Um, you, know, you know, this is one of the most significant battles in that war. I think uh, a lot of people, we, we focus... You know, in, in England, we tend to focus on D-Day a lot and we don't give the Russians any credit for what they did at uh, Stalingrad or namely at Kursk. And so, uh, you know, you have also some some German, uh, uh, you know, Germans in the media talking about how proud they are that their machinery and their armored vehicles are, are <laughs> bursting into Russia. I mean, do they not understand what they're saying? They're basically glorifying what the Nazis did when they killed 27 million Russians. And I'll just remind the viewers that 80% of all German casualties in World War II were inflicted by the Russians, not by the Americans or uh, Britain. So, you know, they did play they did uh, uh, play a significant part in that war, and they also lost more ca uh, people than anybody else, both soldiers and civilians. So it, it is a very, very disturbing uh, sight to have German uh, weaponry, and especially, especially tanks, uh, coming into Russia proper, and uh, uh, I have no doubt it's going to do any. It, it's going to do everything uh, to increase their resolve in Moscow. And as a matter of fact, it also raises the stakes of a potential nuclear war. So you know the consequences of that are, are unimaginable. Well, they did fire rockets at the Kursk nuclear power plant. If the Russians hadn't shot them down, we may have been looking at Chernobyl times ten. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. And I find this so ironic because for for years, I mean, they've been and and quite rightfully, again, I'm I'm not I'm not negating the importance of this, but you know, the uh, the IAEA in Vienna um, and uh, other international organizations have been accusing the Russians. Uh, of you know trying to weaponize the Zaporizhia nuclear plant uh, and and calling for you know uh, calm and restraint and for nobody to fire around that area, which is fine. I understand that obviously this is this goes without saying, but now that you know Ukraine is uh, 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 openly uh, firing at uh, uh, you know the the nuclear uh, facility, the nuclear plant in in the Kursk region, I mean you can't possibly come here and say that it was the Russians who did that and it's a false flag or something. It's obviously the Ukrainians, but so there's nowhere near the amount you know the same amount of criticism or or warnings or you know harsh rhetoric it's it's just simply a given that you know it's all right to do it inside of Russia I mean you, you know Russian the, the the Russian nuclear doctrine is that if there's a threat to the leadership in Moscow or there's an existential threat posed to Russia they can launch nuclear weapons um, I mean I, I wouldn't be surprised if most most countries with nuclear weapons uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I'd be surprised if most countries with nuclear weapons had different rules. So what you're doing is essentially you're daring the Russians. You're 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 testing, uh, you know, a, a red line that sh simply never should be tested because if once you cross that threshold, we're all doomed. I mean, this I shouldn't have to explain mutually assured destruction, but unfortunately, in 2024, we do. We do, uh, and that's one of the great mystery. I never expected to get any more surprises in my life, Richard. I thought I'd seen it all, uh, but you do. Um, I was in a conversation last night with a, a person who should know uh, what he was talking about, and he made the point that if these missiles had penetrated the Kursk nuclear power plant, the, the outcome would have been the virtually identical uh, impact of the explosion of a nuclear bomb. Yeah, and, and I'd also like to highlight something um, that kind of illustrates this recklessness because it's not just coming from Ukraine and NATO, it's also coming from the Israelis. Uh, when they bombed Damascus about two years ago, uh, Syria fired a surface-to-air missile at one of the Israeli jets and it, it managed to chase it for several hundreds of kilometers and it landed about 20 kilometers uh, near Dimona, which is the Israelis' uh, main nuclear facility where they have nuclear weapons and, 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 and a plant. So, you know, they, they, they almost caused a, a disaster for the whole region and potentially the whole world. Uh, but, you know, just by wantonly bombing Syria every week. And another thing is that uh, the Israelis are notorious for not just assassinating Iranian nuclear officials and scientists, but also uh, bombing the nuclear facilities themselves. I mean, how is this not reckless? How is, does this not potentially cause a nuclear meltdown like in Chernobyl or worse? Uh, you know, they've done this at Natanz. They have done this uh, all around the uh, uh, all around Iran's nuclear facilities, which again are, are you know filled with IAEA uh, cameras. Uh, they've got special seals. They, they, Iran is the most inspected country in the world for nuclear weapons. Uh, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, by nuclear inspectors for nuclear weapons. So we know they don't they don't have them. Uh, but nevertheless, the Israelis find you know make this excuse and use this excuse to go and and cause uh, uh, potential nuclear meltdowns. And we see the same recklessness in Ukraine um, being carried out against Russia. I, I think this is. I don't understand, you know, what kind of game these people are playing because it really is the end of the world if it if it goes that far, you know. Uh, it, there's there's no turning back afterwards. So, you know, when we look at what what they're doing in Palestine, I, I, I suppose we shouldn't really be surprised because they, uh, you know, they really are hell bent on on killing humanity, and I mean that in the literal and also in the spiritual sense with 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 all of this barbarism we're seeing on a daily basis, George. Well, uh, every week's barbaric in Gaza uh, over the last uh, almost one year now, getting up to one year, 11 months. Uh, but this was a particularly barbaric week. Not only were there multiple uh, bombing uh, attacks on schools where were sheltered hundreds of women and children, but there was the deliberate bombing at dawn exactly as the Fajr prayer was beginning, a massacre that killed more than 100 people. So devastating was the attack that no single complete body survived. The, uh, the remains were put in plastic bags and weighed 40 kilos for 
a child, 80 kilos for an adult, here's your plastic bag of anybody's remains, go and bury them. As I put it in a tweet which has gone viral, if the Muslim world really existed as a political uh, unit, as uh, many think it could, almost everyone thinks it should, uh, then that would have been the last straw, wouldn't it? The massacre of the Fajr prayers. Yeah. Yes, George, it, absolutely. And, and it, the irony is that who is putting fuel in the Israeli jets and tanks? It's uh, Azerbaijan through Turkey. No word on, on the genocide. You know, er Erdogan likes to, he talks a good one, but he doesn't do anything about it. Um, Saudi Arabia, uh, you know, uh, Qatar, the UAE, Jordan, Egypt, all providing uh, logistical support, economic support, uh, you know, missile defense, you name it. Right. So th one f through one form or another, the these uh, majority Muslim countries are subsidizing uh, and, and helping uh, the, this Israeli genocide to continue. It, it, it's an outrage. It's an outrage, honestly. And, and I, I don't know how these people sleep at night. I mean, we are talking about liquidated human beings, f physically liquidated. I mean, what, what you were just describing, uh, how, how, you know, they, they put people in bags uh, because they couldn't recognize them. How, how does that not enrage anyone, Muslim or otherwise? How does that not make someone just completely, you know, lose it, honestly? I mean, uh, can you imagine if this had happened in the West, what the reaction would be? I mean, probably kill millions of people in response, uh, you know, and, and, and then just say, well, too bad. Uh, I, I sometimes tell myself we should be thankful that the Palestinians are not vengeful, uh, spiteful people, uh, because after everything that's been done to them, never, never mind yesterday, never mind yesterday. Uh, we really should thank our lucky stars. We don't, we don't deserve their forgiveness. We don't deserve their mercy. Uh, the, the fact that this is just continuing, you know, you, you mentioned the number of schools that have been bombed, eight schools uh, in the span of a week. And this argument that, you know, well, there were Hamas uh, people inside, I, 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 don't, I don't care. I mean, this is like saying, you know, we can bomb a school in London because there are people of, of the Labour Party inside of the school. What, what does that mean? Or some, uh, you know, there's some members of the armed forces paying a visit there. We, we can just bomb the school and kill, you know, hundreds of people. What, what does that mean? That's, uh, that's a ridiculous argument. Not to mention that you, you'd have to be trusting Israel uh, to, to tell the truth in the first place, right? But even then, it doesn't make any sense. Schools are, are protected civilian infrastructure. Even if they're used for military purposes and they lose that status, the civilians that are inside do not lose their status as civilians. You cannot just murder, you know, uh, 10 tenfold or, or, or ten times the amount of civilians uh, for a, an immaterial military gain. And, and in addition to that, I should just note that the, uh, the photographs and the names released by the Israelis are, are simply, uh, you know, they're just random names and photos that they picked. These are not Hamas commanders. They took 16 hours to publish the names. Now, if you're murdering 100 people, and you're absolutely certain of who you're targeting. Why would you wait 16 hours to release those names? How come so, some of these people that are listed are dead? They, they were killed days before the attack. How are they, you know, alive in the school again? I mean, th this is farcical at this point, but, you know, no Western journalists, uh, no Western media organizations are going to scrutinize what the Israelis put out. The Israelis commit crimes, investigate themselves and absolve themselves of, of the worst atrocities we've seen since World War II. Finally, uh, Richard, uh, there are several points of view. Uh, the uh, Houthi spokesman in Yemen said that the Iranian and resistance retaliation to Israel was underway. Fox News in the U.S., quoted by Colonel Douglas McGregor, uh, say that any moment uh, the Iranian attack will begin. What's your take on what's likely to happen and when? Well, I, I think uh, we've come a long way since, uh, let's say, 10, 15 years ago, where the Israelis would assassinate, uh, you know, Imad Mughniye or um, uh, Sheikh Ahmad Yassin. And then, you know, the resistance would say, we'll respond at a time and a place of our choosing. And then we'd have to wait for, you know, two decades. Uh, now we're talking about days, weeks. And I think it's, it's part of the... Um, you know, it's it's uh, it's not the necessarily the element of surprise that that is the advantage here. It's just simply keeping the, the adversary on edge 
uh, not knowing when the attack is going to come. Uh, it, it does absolutely uh, take a toll on morale uh, amongst the troops. And, and of course, the, the commanders constantly have to uh, update logistics, move things around uh, in, in preparation. It, it really does wreak havoc on, on an enemy that is expecting an invasion or an assault or, or a retaliation. So I think you, you could argue in, on, on, on the one hand that waiting does serve one advantage psychologically and also in terms of wasting uh, the, uh, the adversary's resources. At the same time, the, the longer that the resistance don't respond, the, the higher the probability is that the Israelis will feel more emboldened to bomb Beirut and Tehran again. Because we should, we should, uh, we, we should underscore the fact that these were not just assassinations, they were messages being sent to, to two parties. So when they killed Hania, they were sending a message to both Hamas and, of course, to Iran by doing it inside of their capital. And the same thing uh, when it comes to, uh, for, for example, you know, in January when they killed uh, one of uh, Hamas leaders inside of Beirut and the Iranian embassy inside of Damascus. It's a double message. And it shows you they're hell bent on escalation. And so my, my point is just that the, the, the longer they don't respond, the, the, the more emboldened the Israelis will feel. The resistance need to reestablish deterrence because during the last 10 months, they've been able to uh, chip away at Israel's defenses uh, in, in the, on the Lebanese front in terms of the Iron Dome, batteries, command and control centers, reconnaissance, early warning systems slowly, slowly, but surely chipping away at them and pushing the front line against uh, 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 the Israelis in their direction and to Hezbollah's advantage. And the settlements are on fire. People are leaving. Yemen doing the same thing, besieging uh, the Israeli-occupied um, port of uh, Eilat. So that, if things remain that way, it's, it's like you're you know, using a salami tactic or slowly boiling a frog. It is advantageous. But if you don't as, if you don't reestablish deterrence, you're going to end up in a situation where you lose the upper hand and then the Israelis feel, feel even more emboldened than they already are with butchering people in Gaza. And then there's no more, there's nothing left standing between the, the complete uh, eradication and extermination of Palestinians and, uh, you know, uh, the, the civilized world. The resistance will, ha will, will, will lose. So they have to reestablish deterrence. Richard Medhurst, as always, Tour de Force. Thanks for joining us on the mother of all talk shows.